Hey guys, welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which is always with my friends. And today we have here today Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. <laughs> All right. And Landon, what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. But we have to preface this, that this will be, the for the first time in Interstage Window, part one of or Harry Potter and the Order of Phoenix. Yes. Because... I don't know if any of you read it recently or thought about reading it recently, but this is a fucking 600 page book. Uh, yes. <laughs> so and there's a lot in it. Um, so we had to, we had to break it into two parts for you. All of the content. Yep. We realized that if we cut enough to make this into a single episode, we would be cutting things that would make us feel like we were remiss and not really um, allowing you into our thoughts on this book in a way that was satisfying for us. So at the end of the day, of course, you know, you guys are here hanging out with us, breaking down all of these pieces of media, kind of like a little insight into our, our little like book club that the two of us have together. And if we're not really talking about everything we want to talk about in the books, if we're sad about cutting certain things, then, you know, we should be we should be sharing that otherwise. So in addition to having a regular fandom episode like we like to have, this the the regular episodes that we like to have will be in two parts so that's part so part one today the focus is on um abuse right the focus is on abuse that's what we're going to be talking about <laughs> i know that we've made it to book five without talking about abuse uh but did you know that harry is heavily abused <laughs> oh my gosh i didn't know i didn't know that harry as well as several of the other characters face abuse and have um lots of uh their personality shaped by the abuse that they faced i didn't know yeah. did you also know <laughs> that the abusers are highlighted as the heroes of the novel wow new what? concept new concept opening all the cans today that's right kitty and welcome in thank you so much okay all right, let's <laughs> let's show you guys. So yes, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, that is what we are going to be talking about today. And this first part is focused on all of the things in relation to um, abuse and kind of uh, the structural setup of um of certain things inside the world so if we did not cover your favorite um discourse <laughs> order of the phoenix discourse then maybe come to part two so because we're only going to be talking about half of our thoughts today yes there are yeah. many thoughts so uh <laughs> we should probably get started because we like to run these long and today's not gonna be any different so nope. Uh, we'll, see if we're, we'll see if we're on time today. We're trying. <laughs> Try really hard. First mm -hmm. and foremost, this episode of Interstage Window will contain Harry Potter spoilers and the extended universe works. Uh, we cannot talk in this about this in isolation because we've already read the whole series. You've probably read the whole series if you're watching this. There's a Fantastic Beast movie coming out next month. We'll probably that might be bitched about. Uh, you never know. You never know. And we're gonna just talk about all of it. So if you if you don't want any spoilers, turn this off. Watch the VOD after you've read it. That's all I can say. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope any nobody cares about spoilers at this point, but we're not a spoiler-free show, so we always like to warn. And there's I one other thing we... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I appreciate the TikTokers, that there's like a whole genre of TikTokers of people who haven't read Harry Potter before and were never into the movies who are now reading it. I'm very wow. interested in that genre of TikTok. So if you're what one of those world. TikTokers... What a world. You Get don't have to read Harry Potter, everybody. If you really, ha you don't have to. I mean, for my entertainment, it, you do. I mean, it, it was it was very of its time. <laughs> But but it's not just, we don't have just a spoiler warning. There is another warning that we like to say in regards to all of our Harry Potter streams. And that is that um, we're going to be discussing really serious topics. Abuse is a huge topic inside of uh, the Harry Potter universe. There are also um, some, there's also some anti-LGBTQ rhetoric that happens within the books. There's um, some unfortunate... Uh, anti-Semitism that happens in the books. The, a lot of things in the books are very are pro-slavery. You know, there there's some things. There's some things in these books. So this, you know, if if you are a sensitive person, then um, this is probably not the stream for you. Or it's it's not chill fun times when we talk yeah. about Harry Potter. So, I guarantee yeah. you, abuse will be the number one topic in this. Yeah, for today, uh, all, for today, all forms. So, <laughs> uh, if you do not want to hear, do not listen any further. Yes. Uh, 
The other important thing that we have is that we here at Enter Stage Window want to make clear that we do not agree with Joanne Rowling's abhorrent statements against the trans community. Uh, and we don't support TERFs here. We encourage that our viewers donate to the nonprofits to support trans youth. Uh, we recommend the Trevor Project. And if you do not have money to, uh, to donate right now, please, there are lots of, uh, there are lots of um, petitions being signed for right now for the bills in Florida that is do not say gay and the trans bill that is trying to be passed through uh, the Senate in Texas that is trying to say that trans kids need to be reported to uh, social services and removed from their homes. So yep. please go sign. Uh, if you do not have money to donate, please go sign and research information about that because what's happening right now in those states is abhorrent. Yep. And, I, and um, our hearts go out to all of the um, trans youth, as well as people whose, uh, whose loved ones include trans youth in Texas and Florida right now. Um, we absolutely condemn everything that's that's happening there in, in regards to that. And, uh, and it does seem like in Texas in particular that most courts are not going to uphold uh, this bill. But um, the, the second that we stop putting pressure on it is, is the second that um, they, uh, they make a different decision. So we have to keep applying pressure, even though things in Texas look like they're going to turn out okay. Uh, don't rest on your laurels. So and, and even then, uh, make it harder for the next people because there will yeah. be the next people trying to push things through. Do not make this a close race. Yep. Um, yep. So please, please go out there and make it known and make your make your statements loud. Yep. Um, shall we start on our topic then? Yes, let's actually get into it. And you guys know we like to start with favorite things. <laughs> favorite things? Well, Karen, what is your favorite thing from Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix? Okay, so my favorite part of Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix is the Queen, Minerva McGonagall. Okay, so she's great. I think everybody loves Minerva McGonagall, even people that are like, you know, oh, I'm I'm older now, I'm so over Harry Potter, I don't know why it's still popular, blah, 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 blah. Like, even those people are like, yeah, but that McGonagall chick, she's cool. <laughs> and I just love body. it. I just love it because she is one of the few characters in Harry Potter that um, takes an active role in fighting uh, the oppression and the poor systems that exist within the world of Harry Potter and um, and actually is successful in a lot of of ways like she straight up stands up to umbrage she um is one of the few characters within the novel i'm not talking about the movie i know it's different in the movie but within the novel most of the characters for example do not care um when uh when for example trelawney gets fired but um but mcgonagall makes it clear that uh that this that these sorts of things are are not okay and there is no question that um harry sees that within mcgonagall and thinks that she stands for for truth and for justice and i'm not saying that she's perfect but she's one of the better characters and she's one of the very few where i can point to and say ah this is actual action <laughs> against the evil that is going on in this system. And there's not a lot of characters in Harry Potter that do that. So for that, uh, McGonagall is my favorite thing of this episode in Order of the Phoenix. We give we give Minnie a round of applause. She yes. is one badass motherfucker. Mm -hmm. um, love her. Lo do love her. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely love her. So that's my favorite thing. Landon, what is your favorite thing for this episode? All right. So anyone who knows me knows that I love, uh, I love dark with a twist. I love evil colored pink, uh, which means Umbridge is my flavor of evil. Love it. But there's one particular tool that she uses that was just, I remember reading it and just looking at what I was reading on the page and going, wow, it's okay that my mind is as twisted as it is because if this isn't Harry Potter, I can read, I can write terrible things too. Uh, and that is the blood quill, uh, which in this series, Harry uses as a punishment 
when um, Umbridge gives him a punishment, he must write lines uh, of I must not tell lies. And he says that Voldemort is back. And those lines do not appear just on the page, but they appear carved into his hand and written in his own blood. And it is just so good. <laughs> it is so evil and like had such a visceral effect on me as a young child that I was like this I want to write this I want to write something to make someone feel this emotionally disturbed (laughs) so remember when we talked about how (laughs) last episode the Death Eaters are not scary past the ending of um the Goblet of Fire you know the fights with them subsequently are just not that scary and how remiss we were to admit that and to to feel that because we know that these books can be scary because this is an example of where it is really scary like and even rereading those as an adult they are they are frightening they are heartbreaking like the way that harry insists on suffering in silence as this happens that he doesn't go tell anybody that he feels powerless to let any other adult know that this is happening to him that All he that in abuse. some ways feels like this is uh normal to some extent it's just it is gut wrenching so, and it's just so well written. It's it's wonderful. It's yes. it's just it's evil sparkle like but in pink, and it's beautiful, and I love it. Yes, um, <laughs> we're gonna talk a little bit more about what I, when we get to a little bit a little bit later. Um, what I feel is like J.K. Rowling's mean streak that yes. appears, but this is where it really shines. The fact that she has that mean streak in her means that she can write these um, very these everyday villains in a way that is like very um, realistic yeah. while still well, being scary. There's a whole debate as to like what what villain is the worst villain in the Harry Potter series and I have never seen someone pick Voldemort over Umbridge no. Umbridge I think is and we'll and we'll get into that but man oh man oh man <sighs> she's so, evil and and the thing about her villainy is you've up. met her before <laughs> yes and we'll discuss this in a second so we can't get yeah. ahead of ourselves but yeah man oh man we all have an Umbridge in our life yep <laughs> all right Let's do the summary, my favorite part. Okay, you guys, as you guys know, um, because we recognize, especially with Harry Potter, that it's probably been a while since you've read them, we want to refresh your memory on the plot so that we're not kind of regularly going back and and explaining the plot as we talk. So because of that, Landon writes these um, beautiful plot summaries for us. So now Landon is going to explain, in general, the plot of the Order of the Phoenix and everything that you need to know to keep up with what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, I took this 650 page book and I put it into one page. So I will miss things and I'm sorry. Good luck. (laughs) Harry starts his school year in the grips of PTSD after watching his crush, I mean, fellow Triwizard Tournament champion die at the hands of the resurrected Lord Voldemort. He is struck, struck at his abusive family's house during and dreaming of days until that he can be with Sirius and join the rest of the wizarding world once again. That's when the Dementors attack and him attack both him and his cousin. Harry fights them off and breaks the wizarding world's most sacred law. No magic outside of school, unless you accidentally blow up your aunt, that is. As punishment for this heinous act against the wizarding world, he has been expelled and deemed powerless by his aunt and uncle. They once again locked him in his room after a letter of a mysterious voice causes Petunia not to kick Harry out onto the streets. A few weeks later, a whole operation turns up and rescues Harry and takes him to Grim Old Place, his uh, Sirius's Black's ancestral home, where he learns about a secret organization built by Dumbledore in the first Wizarding War that has been rekindled in the rise of Voldemort's return. There he spends the better part of the summer in enraged that they didn't help him sooner and that Dumbledore won't talk to him even after he saves Harry from being officially expelled. When Harry finally returns to school, he discovers that Dolores Umbridge the new, is the new DADA professor, which makes it very clear to everyone outside of the 
that everyone outside of the order has turned against Harry, including the press, which does a quick 180 from praising Harry last year to calling him the boy who lost his mind. As the Ministry and Dumbledore continue to fight for control over the world and Hogwarts, Hermione starts a dueling club taught by Harry since the DADA is only being taught in theory in order to stop Dumbledore from being taught, sorry, in order to stop Dumbledore from raising a child army, which is something that he's definitely done in previous wars. Naturally, they call this secret dueling club Dumbledore's army. But the ministry is not the only enemy haunting Harry. His dreams are growing more and more entrenched with Voldemort's until one day he dreams of being a snake attacking Mr. Weasley in the hall of the ministry. And it turns out it wasn't a dream at all. Mr. Weasley was near death uh, protecting something in the Department of Mysteries. When they return back to school after, ho- after winter holidays, Harry is expected to learn from Severus Snape, who has proven to not be abusive enough to Harry, to teach Harry how to relax and feel safe by constantly and continuously attacking him over and over again. But all good things, because Harry's life has been great so far, must come to an end, and Umbridge finds out about Dumbledore's army. The Ministry goes to hold Harry responsible, but Dumbledore, who has yet not spoken to Harry all year, sacrifices himself and goes into hiding. The worst is yet to come because during exams, Harry has a dream where Voldemort has kidnapped Sirius and has taken him to the Department of Mysteries. Harry rushes to Umbridge's office and Creature, a sad house elf who's been abused about as much as Harry has been, confirms his suspicions. So after tricking Umbridge to go into a forest where she insults centaurs who proceed to kidnap her and rape her, uh, Harry, Ron, Hermione, Ginny, Luna, and Neville take off to London back to the, with on the back of Thestrals. They arrive at the ministry to discover that it was all a trick. They face off with Death Eaters, who are not very scary, and hold their own until the order arrives. Sirius Black, who has come to the Department of Mysteries to save Harry, who thought he was saving Sirius, ends up falling through the veil of death and is lost forever. Yet another father figure and a promise of a better future slips through Harry's fingers, and Voldemort takes advantage, slipping into Harry's mind to duel Dumbledore. But Harry has something the Dark Lord knows not. The power of love once again throts Voldy, and Harry banishes him from his mind, but not not before the Ministry does in fact see that Voldemort is back. Later, in Dumbledore's office, Harry shows the first real sign of anger and grief as he destroys it. Dumbledore tells Harry what the point was all along, the prophecy explaining that Harry is the only person who could have killed Voldemort because Voldemort chose him and that, and in the end, neither of them can live while the other is alive. The book ends with Harry in the perfect position and no other direction to go but to fight this war on his own, the soldier at, D- at Dumbledore's beck and call. He readily and unresentingly returns to his aunt and uncle's house for the summer and do what he must to defeat Voldemort once and for all. Woo! Oh my mm-hmm. gosh. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> so much. Uh-huh. <laughs> so if you guys can't tell from um that summary, uh this is where we're gonna get a little bit less kind of crazy. Have you probably gotten used to for the third and fourth book us being like, oh my god, we love this and we love this and we love this, and this is good and this is good, and oh my god, it could lead to this and da da da. Um, there's gonna be a lot less of that from this book forward. So, <laughs> with that being said, uh, we also want to talk just a little bit about uh, some of the stuff going on around this time for for this particular book, just like we did for some of the others. <clears throat> Um, yes. So this is considered the fork in the road, in the road. Uh, the movies and the books start taking two very distinct routes and routes. Mm -hmm. Um, mostly because movies don't have the luxury that books have, which is time. Um, you can fit 600 pages and as long as your 600 pages are fairly well written and engaging, most people, once they've, they, once they've like dug in 300 pages, are not going to lose steam. Mm-hmm. Um, with a movie, you have a certain cap of time. So you have to make cuts. 
And the cuts that they had made both in earlier movies and this movies starts making a very different movie. Yeah, so you got kind of a different story from here forward in the books versus the movies. And in some ways, the movies are actually better. Like, for example, um, that mean streak that J.K. Rowling's got where all of her characters are just kind of mean. Like Harry's inner thoughts in regards to like Trelawney and Luna specifically. Um, they're just freaking mean. Even Hermione, who's supposed to be like, you know, this bleeding heart, you know, save the house elves character, could not care less that Trelawney's getting fired. And so one of the things that's very easy to cut is like, let's just take all this meanness out. Like, do we really need another scene where Dudley gets abused for being fat? Like, no, we don't. We can cut some of this stuff. And so the movies cut a lot of that. But in addition to cutting a lot of that stuff that kind of makes them a little bit more lighthearted and fun to enjoy, it causes the entire plot to move much faster, which then results in this situation where if you didn't read the books to begin with, it can be kind of hard to follow the movies just on a single viewing. Now, I'm sure if you never read the books and you you kind of watch the movies a couple of times, you can probably figure it out. Like, they're not that hard, okay? Like, they're not... <laughs> They're not crazy hard, like you can figure it out, but it can be a little bit difficult. And I, I know this because um, because the fandom was so big at the time that they were coming out. I definitely had friends that were not avid readers, but they would still watch the movies when they came out. And I, and I remember people saying that to me, like, I didn't really understand this part. And it's like, oh, because they cut this other part. Um, so you've got this kind of situation where we have the um, the people that are really big fans of the books are either like kind of sympathetic to the movies and what they have to do and think that some of the cuts are like the correct things to cut, but then other ones are not. And you kind of have had to read the books to understand the movies. So that also creates people that are like, you know, if you've read the books and you're in love with them and then the movie ends up cutting your favorite thing, you're going to be hateful towards it. And there was a lot of people that also were that were that were not interested in talking about the flaws of the books they were just interested in like well the movie cut this and i didn't like that and it caused these ramifications down the road that were very frustrating for me and um and so you've got this uh this whole situation dudley gets bullied of course dudley gets bullied so we've got um previous episodes on the previous books hectes um on my youtube channel that i definitely recommend recommend going and watching yes dudley gets bullied it's one of the very first things that happens to him in the first book and very, um it happens again and very important to say that he does not get bullied by like a character he gets bullied by the way that he is written yeah and also by hagrid <laughs> he does get bullied by, he does get bullied by hagrid but that's uh, it. But that's the only character as, that bullies him. <laughs> but as far as like the the way that he is written is a huge like yeah. Go watch our previous streams. But yeah, yeah and it's literally uh, just because he's it's just because he's fat. Like J.K. Rowling just really doesn't like fat people. She doesn't just do it to him. Any character that's fat except for Molly Weasley, that's like her exception to pretend that she you know doesn't have this issue. Um, but every other uh character that's fat, she uh then she just bullies them relentlessly in the narrative. And sometimes yeah. actually, like how Hagrid bullies Dudley. <laughs> Um, so there's this there's this divergence between between the two that um that creates this like this schism in the fandom, wouldn't you say? Like at the time, there was heated discussions about this stuff. I also think it's important to contextualize that this is the first movie or the first book that has come out after like the movies. So the movies start cutting things. and JKR has the power in her writing to make things that are, cut from the movies important um and not saying that that's necessarily what she's doing but at the same time the movies had no idea when they were making these decisions to start cutting things in the third and fourth movie that they were going to later on be important in the fifth and sixth and seventh books mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so there is this like unbalanced sort of thing that's happening there Yep. And also at this time, the fandom was still very heavily pretending that J.K. Rowling has everything planned out and she knows everything that's going to happen. It is very obvious looking back now in 2022 that that is not the case, that she just lied. She had some things planned out, but she didn't have any more planning than any other typical author. She was not, she's not a master planner. <laughs> she did not have the entire seven books written. No. She just had like, hey, I think we're going to kill like Severus Snape at some point in the, in the, in the series, Severus is going to die and he's going to be a hero. 
-hmm. like that was the plan probably but like even with this one a huge reason why it took so long for her to write like there was a there was a two two and a half year gap between the fourth book and the fifth book I believe the long summer as we call it (laughs) it's a long summer um and even then a huge reason for how long it took that gap to be is because she was still deciding what the fuck was going to happen who was she going to kill what storyline did it look like what did the last three books look like um and she was planning it then and that's why it took so long for her books for her book to come out and then the other books came pretty quickly after that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah I remember thinking she had the whole damn map and timeline yeah we all thought that at the time Kitty we didn't know the books weren't out yet did. Yeah, Which she was said why? She did. That's why there's that... no there's why there's no connection between the first book and the seventh book. Like yeah. if you read the first book and you read the seventh book and you didn't read anything in between, you'd be like, how the fuck are these the same series? Yeah, because like... there's no there's no it's not like things are set up in the first book that are paid off at the end. Like that doesn't happen yeah. in Harry Potter. It doesn't happen. Um it so yeah, she obviously happening didn't. until this book. We mm-hmm. start getting payoff in the seventh book from this book and a little in the fourth but not much before that. Nope. Nope, definitely not. So yeah, there was there was this kind of schism in the fandom and there was like people that were really and people kind of picked camps, you know, cuz it's the freaking internet and that's what they do and they they would be like I'm primarily a movie fan or I'm primarily a book fan and that meant that you had to to think things in a certain way, you couldn't have a nuanced interpretation. And I remember one of the big arguments in the fandom was like um Harry Hermione versus Harry Ron and that was like a huge thing like if you were a Harry Hermione shipper that meant that you were a movie fan and that you um you thought the the movies were good and the books were annoying and long and problematic and if you were um, a Hermione and Ron shipper then you were a book fan and you thought the movies cut too much and the the movies were so annoying and people that just watched the movies just didn't get it you know and um and the books were so much better because they had so much more depth to them like and these were like serious camps that people argued about and that and communities formed around and still do argue about like that that inherent like in the fandom of like if you did not read the series you are not welcome here sort of attitude still permeates around sometimes yeah Mm -hmm. um and it, it certainly I mean it very much exists and I think that are also the longevity of the people who read it and were so entrenched are the most people who are in the fandom uh because if for most people if they were just watching the movies it was just a movie Mm-hmm. It was a good movie. They could have been fans of it, but it was just movies. Yeah, they were not. They were not that deep for them. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas with like you know us freaks, it went pretty deep. <laughs> yep. And um, this and this is where I started to to fall actually more into being interested in the fandom and not canon. So I remember feeling like totally baffled and exhausted by this argument. And I was pretty young at the time, right? Like I wasn't. I wasn't you know, I would think I was, when Order of the Phoenix came out, I want to say I was in college. And I just remember thinking like, Mm. this is ridiculous. Like, I just remember reading these arguments and thinking like, this is so stupid. (laughs) So that was, that was like my, when the movie came out for Order of the Phoenix, that was like my feeling in that regard. Yeah, I agree. Yep. Um, So that's some of the background. Some of that background. Uh, but let's get into the next part. All right. So ministry versus Hogwarts. So we wanted to talk a little bit about this with you guys because we feel like in this book, it very much sets up this dichotomy of like the ministry versus Hogwarts because Fudge believes that like Dumbledore is raising this child army to go take on the ministry. And then um, at the end, you know, of course he gets his proof that this is really happening. And honestly, even though it turns out that it's not really happening, um, I do feel like this is something Dumbledore would do and maybe yeah. has done before. <laughs> and like, it's like, it's not like Fudge is, if this is misplaced. So, um, so with that being said, that's kind of the the picture that I'd like to paint as we're I talking also, about Ministry versus Hogwarts. Yeah, it's also very important to remember, like, yes, this book takes place at Hogwarts. So inherently, we are going to think Hogwarts is the more powerful place. But it's also written like it is as well. The Dumbledore holds all of this power by being a principal of a school. 
And yes, he's an incredibly powerful wizard, influential man, has ties everywhere, ambitious, abusive. But it's like, also we're trying to believe that as a principal of the school, he is dangerous to the prime minister of a country. Makes no sense. It makes no sense. It's a little weird. (laughs) It's a little weird. It's kind of like... Weird. It's kind of like if um if the Ivy League schools here had like the amount of political power that like um I don't know a, a government contractor type of organization actually has. Like if you think about the amount of power that um like Raytheon or Boeing or some of those companies have in our country, like that's quite a lot, right? So like imagine if like the Ivy League schools had that level of political power. I cannot. It just doesn't make any freaking sense. And I just can't imagine that um, that Hogwarts is any different, except that we're given evidence that um, it does have a lot of political power because up until Umbridge comes in, it is implied that there was no state mandates or regulations on Hogwarts curriculum, which makes no sense. I have what? never understood. I've, I've never seen a school that's like that. Crazy. Uh, that like even even private into institutions have an idea of what they should be teaching, mm-hmm. um, and it's again it's like homeschooling. Homeschooling has curriculum yes! standards. <laughs> we've seen we've seen it, and, and again, like it's hard to compare the educational system in U.S. versus English is like comparing apples and oranges. However. English still has standards in which and curriculum in which they are expected and required to teach. Like the English school system still has requirements, still has certain levels. While their levels are based off of the or their graduating tests, like A levels, where ours is more oh met for requirements for graduation. Lunar underscore Lunar. daydream gift. Oh my gosh, one Lunar, to Novatoki. thank you so much for the oh five oh gift subs. Novatoki, Landon Insanity, TJ Bomet, Divian, Fox and Bear. Please enjoy your tier oh. one gift subs from Lunar. Thank you so, so, Lunar so, so, so much. Daydream we're going to let those, um, we're gonna to gonna let those play for a minute before we jump back into this. Uh, two more, I think. Lunar underscore daydream gifted a tier one sub to Jamba. Thank you, Lunar. My Thank secondary you. account has one now, too. <laughs> now your, la- your phone account has a, tier um, one sub to has a gift and bear sub. 1997. Thank you so much. You guys are welcome to to do gift subs and donate and things like that because but I was as we said at the top of the stream um, for today's stream, we recommend you either uh, in instead of or in addition to give to organizations like the Trevor Project to try to fight some of the anti-trans bigotry that um, JK Rowling loves to perpetuate in uh, in her her tweets and in her political activism. All right. Um, but what I was back saying- to curriculum. Yes. So obviously this is based, this is based off of the English standard of teaching, which is teaching towards the exam. Your examination that you are eventually going to try for is A levels. And then after A levels, depending on your test, you can then choose sort of a pathway after that, depending on your score. Whereas in the United States, our school system is a series of requirements that you have to meet in order to graduate, to receive a diploma. So two very different sways of school systems. Obviously Hogwarts is set up more in reference to English schooling. So they are testing for their OWLs and their EWTs. Um, But even then it's like, so it's up to the teachers to know what's on the test to eventually teach you what could possibly be on the test. But there's no expectation on how that's done because Dolores Umbridge can come in here and be like actually we're going to just teach theory it doesn't make any sense does it because like this this is so these newts and owls are so entrenched in the um in the workforce that you have to get certain owls and certain um, scores on your newts to get certain jobs so what that literally means is that in certain ways Hogwarts has more political power than the ministry. If we couple the the way that newts and owls work with um, the way that that kids are sorted and we have like literally an evil house with Slytherin, this means that the systems and structures inside Hogwarts 
are far more impactful politically, economically, and socially than the things that the ministry controls. And this just blows my mind. Well, again, it's based off of it's based off of the English school system. So it makes sense in reference to the English school system. However, when you then zoom out and realize that Hogwarts is the only wizarding school building all of these, then yes, it gives it a huge amount of power. It's one right? of those things that she didn't think through clearly because she was basing it as a reference to the English school system and pretty much copied and pasted without taking any sort of like, oh, maybe because this is one school and that's all that our people are going from and learning maybe we should change it up a bit yep and it's implied that there's no such there's no other schools there's no such thing as like the public versus private schools there's no such thing as like a a homeschooled wizard like that just doesn't exist and so it just this just makes no sense so basically what we can take from this book is that there there is no standard curriculum but there is standardized tests somehow so people that are pra- that praise jk rowling's world building um i think we go back to some of the things we've said in earlier episodes what's really excellent about jk rowling's world building is really the way she describes locations she describes locations in a way that makes you want to go to there that's what she's really good at not building, this type of stuff world building is beyond building the physical world and that is the thing that i think also people who talk about world for- building forget yeah, um, at least in the context of Harry Potter, for sure. Well, and I think in, I think just in, I think like it's really easy and concrete when you're talking about like world building to talk about places and to talk about things like that. When it's also like, what does the pantheon look like, or the religion, or the, the or systems. the way that the government works, or the systems, or anything yeah. like that, uh, that takes a lot more detail than yeah. necessarily this beautiful, wonderful place. Yeah, not a lot of thought put into put in this to the systemic um, the systemic forces within the wizarding world, and this is a good example of it. So, there's this back and forth as far as like what is to be teaching, what is to not be teaching, and ministry, in order to suppress Dumbledore's power, says that a ministry worker has to be on the payroll. Uh, so they hire him her as a teacher, which is still someone who is underling to Dumbledore's power uh and they in in they hired Dumbledore as umbridge but upon realizing that like as a just a teacher she has no power the ministry comes in and then determines that there must be a position that is more powerful than Dumbledore's as headmaster uh, that is about rules and basically curriculum trying to be, um, but not really. And that's the high inquisitor, Dolores. And it Umbridge. doesn't and it doesn't make sense. I mean, this goes back to the same thing of like that we said earlier, Hogwarts needs HR. Where are all of the administrators that clearly work at Hogwarts? Like who does the paperwork? Who um, makes sure that the, the students are paying their tuition? Who um, handles things whenever, you know, there is some type of, of financial or paperwork type of issue that comes up? What, who answers students' questions or parents' questions in regards to this? Like, you know, Dumbledore's not doing all of that and teachers ain't got time, okay? So why is there not like a vice president principal or head administrator type of position already at Hogwarts that Dolores could have just jumped into. Because that's boring and anybody who isn't in a school in a school uh, district or any school environment doesn't think of him. That's why. (laughs) Because because she didn't think and it's stupid. So then she had to create she instead of like addressing those problems she had they had to create something different yeah but i don't and i don't think it would have been a big deal though if it would have just been like well we didn't talk about administrators before because harry didn't have a reason to talk to them like he never had a reason to go to the know. guidance if counselor they, they or suddenly brought in the admin team i would have that in characters that i had never heard of in positions that i had never thought existed i would have hated that way more than this i'm not gonna lie i don't know i don't know bt dubs there's a secretary i'm like there's not a secretary minerva mcgonagall sent the letters to welcome <laughs> to 
<laughs> yeah, because she's got time. Because she's got time to do that on top of teaching her classes. For sure. For sure. Maybe they're hired through the summer. Maybe this is their summer. Like, unlike, <laughs> unlike American <laughs> universities, or not universities, American school system, where teachers are unpaid throughout the summer, maybe they, they are a full year contract and this is their summer job <laughs> is to do all so, the amazing. Bullshit. Landon, I just had the most awful problematic thought. Oh, tell me. What if in addition to being responsible as as like the cleaning yeah. and cooking staff that the house elves yeah. were the administrators? What if what if what if we just what if that was how it was? That would actually kind of make sense. Do that would think, actually kind of make do sense. Do we actually think Minerva McGonagall is stuffing 700 envelopes? No. She ain't got time for that. She is busy. It's not even the house elves. Ready? There's a simple solution to this. You ready? Magic. All of it is fucking magic. We never learn any of this magic. We never see any of this magic. But that is what the excuse is. Is that there's... My God. <laughs> I wish J.K. Rowling had just been like, you guys, it's magic. Shut up more. I wish. <laughs> That's the kind of editorializing I need. <laughs> yeah. If if instead uh, of like, if instead of Neville throwing over the, the shelf of time turners and just destroying all the time turners because she was annoyed at people asking why time turners didn't come back, if she would have just said, fuck you guys, it's magic, leave me alone. Um, I think, I think we would all be better for it as a fandom. Yeah. Also way <laughs> less transphobic. Oh my Do God. That. <laughs> she's done yes um no it's it's just a whole thing so in comes dolores umbridge who is like why the government has this much control of the school i'll never know but it, but they and do. they didn't before they didn't before and all of a sudden they do it makes no sense yeah and then like and so they they hire someone who is terrible <laughs> and uh toad like and they give her the position of high inquisitor, which like also, where's, not only does Hogwarts need HR, Ministry of Magic needs PR. Like, where the fuck did we come up with the high inquisitor? Why? What Why an awful was name. Happening? Why was, like, she's, she's asking all of the questions and trying to find the crime. Like, Jesus Christ, no. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's literally just like, I mean, they might as well have just like put a cop in the school. They might have might as well have just done like what um, our school system started to do when I was going through, which didn't work out and they're still doing it today and it still doesn't work. Or they just put like, there's a school officer, there's a cop in the school. That's basically what she does. And guess what? It works about as well for Hogwarts as it does for American schools. It doesn't. I can't say anything because, you know. Yep. You don't have to comment. You don't have to comment. <laughs> <laughs> just know the smile says everything um no i think i think that it's it's silly and stupid and i hate it but you know what umbridge is there and she's a bad bitch so and we love we'll her favorite it. villain favorite villain Obviously, for sure favorite villain and let's talk about it this is a perfect opportunity to talk about why dolores umbridge is not only the favorite villain but the fucking scariest villain that exists yeah. within the series so i have a story I have a story about my Dolores Umbridge. There was a fifth grade teacher in my school system who I swear to God was Dolores Umbridge. Not in the fact that she was like toad-like, okay? She wasn't ugly because evil and ugly don't go together, JK Rowling. That's just, that's not a thing in real life. However, yeah, um, she- she pretty she, and ugly too. In fact, most you know people how, all are pretty and ugly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know how like Dolores Umbridge has the cat obsession? This teacher had a cow obsession. She loved cows and cow print. Cows were all over her classroom. Cows was like her thing. And she um, and she also, the other fun thing about this particular teacher was she said, dress code, what's that? She would wear the most inappropriate, like sexy, fuck me type of clothes to school in front of the kids. And they were like see-through, like she would wear see-through stuff and like skimpy stuff. And like this girl, first of all, in addition to like um, that being just super inappropriate for teachers, she had like a regular adult's body, so they didn't even look good on her. Uh, so it was just like, it was just like awful. It was just like all kinds of awful, not appropriate for kids. Um, come to find out later that what she's actually trained in is, um, is special education. 
but nobody would give her that job because she was so bad at it. So she kept getting let go from the special education systems, which is how she ended up being a regular fifth grade teacher. And um, and yeah, I was subjected to that. So that was my real life Dolores Umbridge. And she was just as awful, did all kinds of just as awful things. Now, she didn't like she didn't like carve into kids arms. OK, so don't don't get me wrong. Um, but, uh, you know, regular, regular level awful. So I had a real life Dolores Umbridge in, in my situation. I have a couple of thoughts. One, you have to try to be hired. You have to try to be fired from special education. So that really goes to show you when someone gets fired from special education, yep. what kind of teacher they are. Second, JKR decided that she would make her most useful villain toad-like, ugly, single, desperate, hyper-feminine cat lady. And that was going to be the evil villain. Which, again, J.K. Rowling, your misogyny is showing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Jesus Christ, this is how you think about women? Mm -hmm. This? We get so few examples of women in our in our book. And this is what you decide to throw at us? Don't get me wrong. I love a good, bad girl, girl bitch, ass boss, ass villain. And not every single woman has to be good or even beautiful. But when you throw all of that together, that shows a lot. That speaks volumes. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Mm-hmm. Very, I'm very upset about this. Love Umbridge, great character. But I think the fact that there are no other characters like her, written like her, or we see anything close to what she is as a like juxtaposition of like, oh, this is also a crazy cat lady who is kind. Because also our only other Kate crazy cat lady is Fig, who who perpetrated perpetrated Harry's abuse for years. So, and I was also lonely and single and ugly. Yes. Like, where's our, where's our well-adjusted cat lady to contrast Dolores Umbridge? We don't get we one. Exist. Or like our kooky, crazy cat lady. We exist too. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Because when you think of the, the other character that's kind of closest to like the very feminine, kind of weirdo, you know, hyper focused on their, you know, their special interest type of stuff, Trelawney comes to mind. And what does she do to Trelawney? First of all, all of our characters that we actually get to know well, like our main trio, freaking hate her. And then she is basically just this this drunkard that runs around the school doing absolutely nothing in, in the books. Um, movie Trelawney supremacy, by the way. Movie Trelawney is way better. Um, oh, book Trelawney is just sad. And it, it just, it, we don't, you're right, we don't get a lot of women in Harry Potter. And the fact that um, this is the main time we get a villainous woman is, uh, is, is pretty telling. It's pretty telling. Sometimes we have to go off the, off the rails, and this is me going a little off the rails. Um, do you notice that every single woman of a certain age is single and lonely? Mm-hmm. Even McGonagall's single and lonely. There, she has no right to be. She's a boss. I'm trying to think of a older woman in the series that has a significant other other than Molly Re- Weasley. And again, Molly Weasley is not portrayed as a woman. She's portrayed as a mother. There's a mm-hmm. difference between a portrayal in a series. Um, so it's like this fascinating idea that anyone who is portrayed as a woman above the age of 25 is single or and alone and either has tragedy in their past which she later then editorialized her uh, mcgonagall to have or is just downright disgusting Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's really telling it's really telling and especially if you think about like um jk rowling's past relationships herself because her first husband was an abuser and that is something that she has spoken about several times and um, and wow, does it show in the way that she writes her old and w- older women characters. Also just fascinating from the perspective of this as being a woman who's supposed to be uplifting and protecting womanhood. Mm-hmm. That this yeah. is how she sees and writes women. What a great feminist. All the variety of women that we get, man. <laughs> anyway, 
anyway, back on topic. Sorry, I just <laughs> needed to take a left turn there because, like, man, that fucking sucks. Really sucks. It really sucks. All right. Yeah. So then the next thing that we just wanted to really touch on super briefly because we're mentioning Umbridge, so we just have to talk about Fred and George's Great Escape. Okay, so I have a slight little um, tangent rant that's gonna that comes back here because um, I, I don't remember if I put this in my notes or if I actually said it on an episode, but it really bothers me in the early books, like before the Weasleys win the lottery, right? Which, okay, they're not poor anymore. They won the lottery, which is just such a weird way to tackle that. But anyway, wait, before wait, wait. then... No, 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 no. They won the lottery and that all that it afforded them was a trip to Egypt. Not that they're not right. poor. Right, right, right. They they are still, but they they start to do better, right? And it's not a hot topic. But in the early books, it is a hot topic that the, the Weasleys are, you know, really downtrodden. They do not have a lot of money. And yet they have this rich friend, Harry. And it really bothers me that in the early books, they talk about Christmas gifts that Harry gets from the Weasleys, and Harry never gives them any gifts in return. Like, he never gives them anything like he never he never uses his wealth in a clever way to help them out like i know there's parts of the book where they talk about like oh well they wouldn't accept it so harry can't just give them a stack of money and i agree with that and i understand but harry could have done things that were a little bit more clever to help the weasleys out in a way that wasn't so harmful like for example when ron breaks his wand in the book that has gildry lockhart i know that we have to have the broken broken wand because it comes back and um you know, the Gildery Lockhart uses the broken wand and it backfires, blah, blah, blah. But Ron could have still kept that broken wand for the plot point, And Harry could have still like gotten him a new wand for his birthday or for his um, for Christmas or something like that. So he didn't have to suffer through the whole book with a broken wand. And I feel like this whole thing, this whole great escape that Fred and George do is kind of like another time where JK Rowling is like, all right, guys, I'm getting really annoyed if you're asking me why Harry doesn't buy more stuff for the Weasleys. Fine. He gives his Triwizard winnings to the to the twins so they can open their shop, which is great, by the way, because he didn't need the money. So I'm glad he did that. But it's just kind of like this doesn't erase the fact that Harry doesn't really help the Weasleys in, a, in ways that he could. So little little aside there, bringing it back, um, bringing I, back that complaint. Yeah. I very much disagree with that take, but that's okay. Like, I, I think that, I think that if, I think that yes, the fact that Harry does nothing about gifts is interesting, but I also think that that's true to character. Harry didn't receive gifts for the first 11 years of his life. Um, and while it Excuses. is- Excuses. Yes. Excuses. Absolutely. A hundred percent. It's also not a 15 year old's responsibility to take care of a family. And I think pushing that narrative would have not been good. Um, I do like that he ended up giving his triumphs or tournaments to Fred and George. I think it really shows that like you can be successful in ways that are outside of school, which mm -hmm. is a narrative that we had not even seen or considered until this point, until the great escape, when Fred and George was like, actually, we don't fucking care. <laughs> <laughs> like we got our OWWLs, which is all we legally need to be to do to be here. We're of age. We're out. We're outy. Like we're gonna go make a bunch of money and engage in capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> yes fred and george literally said we're part of the owning class now peace out sauerkraut see y'all never again bye <laughs> and then they remain super successful and i'm here for it okay fantastic I'm I am here for it. I... We're not going to talk about the tragic ending for Fred and George, okay? We're saving that for later, but they have happiness, true happiness for a few years, and we love that for them. They, I mean, what? True happiness for years to come, even after. Like, there's some, there's a legacy that was built prior to death, and that is okay. Sure. Um, I, I guess his money can keep him warm at night without his brother. Yeah, it's fine. That's that's what most people think. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure money does buy happiness. I believe the magic number is $75,000 a year. I've heard uh, that. I've heard that. <laughs> any more than that, you're unhappy again. Any less than that, unhappy. But $75,000 a year for most places in the United States, hit me up. Yep. Uh, no Give me that raise. 
love I is it a raise if it's more than double your salary? <laughs> yeah, it's still a raise. Is it still, it's a, still raise? a raise? Or is it at that point just you know, socialism? La Landon, uh, this is why you have to start your own stream so that we can gift stuff, um we can gift things to you and, and gift you Twitch subs and things like that. <laughs> why it's just probably. Uh, <laughs> with what time though? With what time, Karen? I don't know. I don't know, girl, man. Yeah. <laughs> Add another hour of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd still find a way to fell it too much. Uh, but anyway, <sighs> I also think that this is the most like lighthearted moment of the book. Yeah. The book is so dark and dour and it needs to be like, it needs to have that serious undertone to it. But like, this is like a cl palate cleanser that comes way too late. <laughs> yeah, it's such a fun moment. And it's a fun moment in both the book and the movie. Yeah. I love this scene in the movie. Oh, it is fantastic. So Both of them are so good. I, I like that they are very different, but they have the same joy to it. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. gives the same feeling. It's an incredibly well-written scene in the book, in my belief. It is a cute, it is a cute scene in the movie. Sorry. Oh, bless you. Sorry. Yeah, I, I love it. This is like, this is probably if, if we're going to talk about anything that I really enjoy in the books, it's this part. It's like, it feels so satisfying too. It feels so satisfying that yeah. Fred and George are able to do this, all the work they put into it, um, all the product testing that they did, it coming to some kind of fruition. It's just, it feels, it, you, got, you got your setup and you got your payoff and it just feels real good. I wish that there were more moments like this in the rest of the series from yes. here on out. like okay so great example i know that this is not the book we're talking about but there is an amazing amazing youtube video for half-blood prince that is like reworking the movie trailer as if it was a you know 2000s coming of age like love story fun movie instead of about being harry potter <laughs> um coming of age story it's a fantastic they've they've taken the same scenes they've done just different music behind it taking different scenes and they've turned it into like this this feeling of as if they were teenagers and getting older and everything like that and this book lacks it so much uh this is the only moment of joy in my opinion in the book yeah everything else is super dark in a way that it makes it hard to remember that this this is about a boy who's 15 years old yeah it's like it's like we need that we need that like um you know ball scene like what we have where where the boys are just sitting sullen and and uh because they didn't get the dates they want they're going to treat their current dates bad just like funny stuff like that that's like so teenager thing to do um and we just don't get any of that in this book this scene is like the only one and from here on out you're right the series just doesn't have those moments the sixth one has a few more than this book does um because, but it's way longer than this but, book but it is no it's shorter oh it's um, shorter yeah it's it's about it's about 60 pages shorter okay this is the longest book um but no but it it, it does have a couple more moments but also it's it, without getting into what next ta what next series or part two is going to be about uh harry's a little bit more in the driver's seat or a little bit more wants other than survival yeah uh and this is that is a huge part of why it feels empty because mm -hmm. a lot of it is empty this is a this is a book of filler in some ways yeah yeah um which sucks to come after such a great book. <laughs> okay, yep. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of the the one thing we really like in this book is that great escape part. <laughs> um, so continuing right. on from from this, we want to get a little bit more into Dumbledore's influence specifically on the Wizarding world because it really does feel like when you look at the structures of how the Wizarding world is set up, that really Dumbledore kind of is on top. It's not Fudge that's on top. It really is kind of Dumbledore. So there's like this whole part in the first few books where the, the idea is dropped here, there, and everywhere that, you know, Dumbledore is an incredibly influential and powerful wizard. He's been, he's been asked to run for Ministry of Magic a 
couple of times has always turned it down. He has friends in high places. He's incredibly powerful. He's a hero. The minister writes to him on occasion for advice. All the previous ministers did. It's like we have been told that this man should be leading the wizarding world and everyone treats him like he does without any real power. Mm -hmm. Um, And and so it's it's an interesting turn of events when all of a sudden that control that Dumbledore doesn't have that people have just like assumed he's had or have given him without any real standing, like they're fighting for it back in a way that Dumbledore isn't fighting for it back either. <laughs> Yeah, it's very strange because prior to this book, we um, we we understood Dumbledore's power to be more like soft power. You know, he was a very powerful wizard, like magically powerful and um, well liked. And that combination means that he can have influence, but he didn't have like real power. Not not really until this book. And it's like, oh, oh, wait, no, it's not just that people really are scared of him in the way of like he has real power. And it's just, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. And he also seems untouchable in a way that Harry, like, it's very interesting to watch, watch in this book as the, as the Wizarding World disparages both him and Harry together. And Harry's, the opinion of Harry changes. Yeah. But we don't find any adults where the opinion of Dumbledore changes other than those who perceive danger in giving him power. Mm -hmm. In fact, Dumbledore seems more powerful now that the Wizarding World is trying to turn everyone against him. Uh, but we don't witness anybody turning against him except for Fudge. Like Fudge yeah. and Umbridge, who is a character we had never met before, are the only people in the books who are against Dumbledore. <laughs> mm hmm. Mm hmm. And it's kind of like we've got some we've got some undercurrents implied that like in general, people are not uh, super with him. And this is implied through Harry. It's through like, um, you know, the conversation that Harry has with his roommates where there's like a squabble. It's, you know, towards, towards the beginning when he first gets to Hogwarts. But it's more just like, we hear students say things like, my mom says Dumbledore is, you know, it's like that type of thing. It's, we don't really see it, which is very confusing in this book because in this book, it opens up the wizarding world quite a bit. Like we, we see things outside of Hogwarts. Like we actually go to the ministry in this book and, um, and it's increased in later books, how often we do that. And so because that world has kind of opened up now. It's very interesting that we don't see more specifics in that regard, that we hear these things more secondhand. Yes. And, and it's, it's, and again, we're left with that hollow feeling of like telling, not showing. Yeah. And it, that's a hollow, easy way to write. I think it would have been more impactful if there had been people, like if, if people hadn't returned to Hogwarts if truly there was missing students in Harry's lives, if instead yeah. she was angry, coming back and saying, you're wrong, you're lying, we don't believe you, being really aggressive towards Harry, and also my mom thinks Dumbledore is crazy, instead of doing that, if Seamus Finnegan didn't come at all and Dean Thomas is distraught because Seamus isn't here, he went to Durmstrang instead, or another wizarding school instead, because... Dumbledore is insane like that would have had more of an impact that would yeah, have been if more like, showed up. Oh. if Harry walked in the great hall and he was like um like a quarter of the students aren't here what where why are there so many empty seats am I super early you know like that would have been way more impactful or new no, more news news papers that are not just headlines that we get but also like the impact of a strike against Dumbledore calling for his resignation things like that would have actually felt like there was there was power there but because there was none of that we as a reader don't see Dumbledore lose any power we only see him gain it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because even though all of these people think he's crazy they're still coming to Hogwarts yeah they're and there's only like supporting him they're right. still they're, they're still there and then we also get the side of everything where he's building an order of the phoenix he's inspiring students to create an army in his name 
um, that the that the ministry is so fucking scared of him that they have to send in a spy and try to gain control over him. And all the while, he has zero. He has like cold res- resting bitch face on. Yeah. Like, it's like <laughs> one of those scenarios where one person is like screaming and shouting at another person, and the other person is just like. It's like that meme where the girl's like sitting there and she's like. <laughs> like that (laughs) it's like like, could you imagine though could you imagine because filch is like the only um employee at hogwarts that actually is not on you know on the dumbledore train could you imagine filch like trying to organize a strike i'm just like trying to imagine like strike organizer filch um you know talking to like uh severus and and like you know i i know you have problems with how the school is run too think about all the things like they never let you have da uh job and like imagine that wow wow okay wouldn't that be amazing i want this now (laughs) and we also see like in this book the amount of loyalty Dumbledore inspires, curates, mm-hmm. um, and how, and and like, that there is no teacher who doesn't agree with him. Yeah. That there is no adult other than Filch and Umbridge that doesn't agree with him other and serious. Filch, Umbridge, and Sir- Filch, Umbridge, Sirius, and Fudge. Those are the four adults. The entire yeah, and, and Sirius doesn't even really count because from the very beginning of this book, you're, we're getting told about how Sirius is um, is not behaving like an adult in in the way that he's treating Harry. Like he's literally scolded by the other members of the Order of the Phoenix um, about his behavior in that regard. We're also seeing we're also seeing um, seriously Sirius being actively punished in mm-hmm. a way that doesn't read as punishment the first time you read this. Yeah. Um, so all of a sudden, Dumbledore has an incredible amount of influence over the wizarding world in a way that we, as a reader, has never experienced before, and is and I was also like introduced so casually in a way that has been, should have been like, oh yeah, this is of course how it's always been, and you as a reader, a casual reader, are just like, of course, Dumbledore has always been this powerful. There's nothing to question here, but there is. Yeah, but when you go back and read it as an adult, <laughs> when you go back and read it as an adult, it's like, wait. No, that's or wrong. Like, that's not been here since the beginning. And here's the deal. I don't even think it's an adult thing because there are so many adults who have read it and have never found a problem with Dumbledore. I think it's the fact that we are diving in, that we are treating this as like research and questioning like the actual mm-hmm. narrative of some of stuff. Well, I think it's true. I think that's true. And and, and the, the reason why we feel compelled to do that is because Harry Potter has been just is because J.K. Rowling just won't leave it alone. And she keeps trying to perfect it and fix it and change it yeah. and editorialize this and that and the other. And so, you know, it makes us be like, all right, well, let's look at the original books and see how good of a job you did. Turns out could have been better. And then also you and I are doing it because of the stream. <laughs> like true. we are we are studying it in a way that is that is deeper than any casual reader who just picks up the books and reads it the first time is or even the second time or the third time in the last 15 years is mm-hmm. going to read it yep um but I would just, I just, I just feel like I would have a lot more grace for these things in regards to the book and not care so much if jk rowling did a little bit more of like guys it's magic stop who cares like no i'm not fixing that plot hole my god stop it you know what are you, what are you talking about we've given her unloaded money <laughs> and power and influence mm. over us now we're questioning that what does that sound like oh my god <laughs> oh my god she thinks she's the dumbledore and she doesn't even know that dumbledore is the bad guy he is in a lot of ways he is in a lot of ways <laughs> all of um, the ways yep. <laughs> we want to talk about a scarier villain than Voldemort. dumbledore anyway sorry this is me going a little crazy no, but we are. We we are definitely on the the anti Dumbledore train. Um, which I know that there's a lot of people that are not that are like, guys, stop complaining about Dumbledore. But we're on the complaint about Dumbledore train. <laughs> I will, I will continue to complain about Dumbledore for the rest of this series. I am so sorry if you are a pro Dumbledore person. I think I've said it since the beginning. I don't feel like I've ever miss miss straight like put you down the wrong path. Dumbledore is the ultimate villain. Amazing character fantastic character i hope one day to write an alba stumbledore i just also hope to realize that he's the villain <laughs> before <laughs> anything else yep <laughs> all right shall we move on yes let's keep talking about dumbledore <laughs> <laughs> all right guys 
we are we are halfway through. This is this is your little break. This is your little intermission. Um, if you need to go to the bathroom or get a snack, we're gonna do a little ad read right now. So now's the time. But keep your earbud hits in so you can hear this. Um, because Landon's got some stuff to say about our sponsor, Audible. Do you want a book about manipulative men during war times? Do you like magic? Do you also like having a female character that isn't just book smarts? or a background character, or an ugly cat lady. Let me tell you about Red Queen and the series, the Red Queen series uh, by Victoria Agard. It is a wonderful, magical fantasy book that takes place uh, during a war where there are two different kinds of people. There are the people who have silver blood and those with red bloods. Those who have silver bloods are actually capable of magical powers. Well, our main character, Mar, finds herself with maybe being a little bit of both uh, and finds herself in between two brothers struggling for power. Uh, and they're both fucked up in the head. And honestly, it's fantastic. And she overcomes both their manipulations in some ways and also doesn't in others. So 100% recommend. And you can find this amazing book because you're like, paperback book. Why would I need that? Audible's got your back. <laughs> you better check how that book landed and make sure you're not breaking the spine. <laughs> it, I know how to throw a book. <laughs> oh, sorry. Of course you do. <laughs> that was funny, though, I hope. I hope somebody clips that. Anyway. <laughs> I'll clip it later. I'll clip it later. That was pretty hilarious. All right. Um, yes. This, sound, this book sounds good. Maybe I'll have to read it. It sounds absolutely up my alley. It's a fantastic book. It's actually a series. So if you read the first one, there's four of them. Um, and, and they're fan, they're great. Um, in fact, Rab was inspired off of one of the princes or has inspirations off of one of the princes. Oh, well now uh, I have to find time to read it. My gosh. Oh, no. <laughs> Whatever but we do. So yes, if you would like to support our show, Interstage Window is sponsored by Audible and you can do your 30 day free trial on Audible using the link that I just put into the chat. And um, as far as I understand it, you only have to do that 30 day free trial for us to get our commission from Audible. You do not actually have to keep it past the 30 days. Although I think Audible is a great service and if you enjoy it too, then you probably should. But there we go. So audiobooks, audiobooks are my jam. I don't got time to actually read books anymore. So I do everything audiobook. Audiobooks are awesome. Love yeah. them. And I can do it's my chores while I'm while I'm reading. Watch it. I can play yeah. Candy Crush and get all the information at the same time. Oh my god! I can play Legends Arceus and actually still read. Isn't that beautiful? It's amazing. <laughs> uh, so yes, that is our ad break. Hopefully you are back. You missed me. You missed me throwing a book, but it was awesome. So it was hilarious. If you missed it, you have to go back and watch it now. Sorry. So sorry. Um, all right. Shall we move on? Yes. Oh, forgot to do that part. So, okay, the order. <laughs> Dumbledore. In the series of a month and a half, not even, three weeks, throws together an entire army called, Dumbled called the Order of the Phoenix. Now, here's the deal. Half the army he had the numbers from before when they did the, the first time around when Voldemort was alive. Uh, but the other half are all new wizards who feel yep, like they wizards. owe new they owe Dumbledore a favor some way yep yep so let's talk about the order of the phoenix um here's my take on order of the phoenix if you think about this this story this book as like a hitler metaphor right and Voldemort is is the wizarding world's hitler he is he is the main fascist right what that means is that the order of the phoenix is antifa Okay, this makes a lot of sense. You've got um, a opposition to the fascism um, in a world where they are not interested in systemic change to actually prevent fascism in the future. Wow, that sounds familiar. So what you've got is this small resistance um, army, and that's basically um, the, the violent part of Antifa. So that's what the Order of the Phoenix is is they are the the actual like antifa super soldiers okay but here's the problem they ain't got no teeth what does the order of the phoenix actually do are they interested in systemic change like real life antifa super soldiers would be okay so if you think about antifa movements in real life 
yes, they, the violent wings do just want to punch fascists, okay? But they are also always talking about systemic change, and there is always a large, usually larger element of Antifa organizations that's not about necessarily punching fash, that's more about how do we solve these systemic problems so that fascist thought does not take root. And the Order of the Phoenix has none of that. They could not care less about the systemic factors that went into creating Voldemort and his followers. All they want to do is punch Death Eaters. That's it. That's it. That's all she wants to do. (laughs) And I mean, I get it. Like, Nazis are awful. I also think it's funny when Nazis get punched in the face, okay? But, like, I would like a world where instead of us having to punch Nazis all the time, we just stopped having people become Nazis. That would be nice, don't you think? Or or build up the people that Nazis hate enough to just like be like, yeah, we don't fucking listen to Nazis, which we also don't do that. And she doesn't do that in this world either. (sighs) It's frustrating. (laughs) And, and the fact that, like, the people who are Death Eaters are some of the people who have the most power in this series. And, well, and, and they don't want anything to fucking do with that. They don't care about that. They just want to go in and attack and protect, and, which are all valid and necessary. But, yeah, it, it got, it's, not, it's no teeth. It's all bark, no bite. It is. It's, like, it's so silly. It's almost like, okay, so... At no point during the book does anybody talk about the the systems inside of the ministry and how that perpetuates and creates the situation we have right now. So what I mean by that is things like the fact that centaurs are clearly sentient and have their own society, and yet they're treated like animals. The fact that there is an entire race that exists for slavery. The fact that people assume um, giants are just violent. Like, and I could go on. Um, you know, we could yeah, talk about the goblins mean. in regards to this too. But it's like, it's just crazy. And, and no, no, at no point does the Order of the Phoenix ever advocate for getting rid of the clear racism in their society. Never. No, they don't, they don't argue like, and not even talking about the races outside of human races. They don't even support, like they actively do not talk about muggle born pure blood issues, which is, which is fine. Cause like the, the excuses is that, okay, fine. They just all automatically believe that there is no issue that if you're muggle born, you're still a wizard. There's no talk about helping werewolves, even though there is a member whose whole deal is that he's a werewolf and he has to infiltrate other werewolves who have joined the dark side because they're angry at the system treating them so sh- goddamn shittily. Yeah, they have a right to be. They have a right yes. to be. Now, now I do not, of course, you know, if Voldemort got into power, it is obvious that he would not uphold his promises to the werewolves and the giants and, and you know, the races that get on their side. But I can t- totally sympathize why they might feel like, hey, this guy right here, at least he's talking to us. And that's what, like, that's the analogy, right? Yeah. That's the analogy that in World War II, Hitler did the same thing with other things. And then it became very clear that he was not following through on any of his promises and he, bad man. And so like fa- anti-fascists took him down and have tried to delete fascism from Germany's history. It's the al- it's the allegory, but like there is no of that same side of the ally side of being like we're gonna fight this and take it down and make sure it never happens again. Yeah, it's just literally it's literally like she- J.K. Rowling wanted to write a Hitler allegory and did absolutely no research into the political um, systems and and political um, movements that were happening during, before, or after World War II. Like, she just didn't. She just took, like, a very high school understanding of, of the way that the World War II happened and, and put it in the book. It's just, it's incredibly simple. It, it is, it, it's just, it's just not good. It's not good. Like, the Order of the Phoenix exemplifies how, how J.K. Rowling did not understand the systems that she was putting in her book. At all. And it's lazy fucking writing. Um, yeah. <laughs> And there's another that's point. There's another point mad. we can make. Like, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, that's what makes me mad about all of this is that 
We finally, after five books, have an opportunity to expand the world and know that like that J.K. Rowling has thought about the world. She did build some of that world out. Was it shitty at the time? Absolutely. Is it shittier now? Absolutely. But she at least thought about it. There's no thought here. <laughs> she just built it out and didn't put a backbone behind it. She was like, here, this is what you want. And then like, didn't give us anything that we wanted. Mm -hmm. and, and it continues. It continues yes. to this day. Um, for example, if you look at what's going on with the Fantastic Beast movies, and um, and because it's because we're constantly like, hey, J.K. Rowling, why didn't the Wizards stop World War II? You know, they clearly know fascism is wrong. It's your whole book is a fascist allegory. Why didn't they stop World War II? And so then we have the Fantastic Beast movie where Grindelwald basically has these predictions that the World War II is going to happen and all of this stuff is going to happen. And um, and then and then so he's trying to prevent it. But then like the good guys are the ones that are trying to stop him. And it's like it's so dumb and it makes no sense. There is and this is what what I keep having trouble with. And we're going to talk more about this in part two. But just this is your this the Order of the Phoenix piece is your little taste of that. What really starts to frustrate me about the later books is we're supposed to grow up with the books. We're supposed to grow up with the books and start getting into it. A teenage Harry that, that could think about things more complexly. And, and he simply doesn't. And it's not just Harry, it's the entire books. There is no ideological underpinning. There is no moral thread in these books. It is literally just good guys versus bad guys. And what makes the good guys good is they is they are labeled good. And what makes the bad guys bad is they are labeled bad. The Order of the Phoenix is only good because we stamped good on their foreheads. Which That's so it. so fucking funny because the most famous quote from the series is not all the world is split into good people and death eaters. But it is. But in it these is. books, it is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, and it's... Yeah, I, it's exhausting. It's this is the this is the crux of it that it's like there is no hope in this book. There is no point in it. Mm -hmm. It is filler. We get world building filler. Absolutely, important things do happen as far as like Sirius Black dying and uh the Dumbledore's army and Harry being willing to like put his life on the line to sacrifice Dumbledore all of those are incredibly important things that will resonate in the future books but none of it means anything now and even the things that are supposed to mean shit now don't yeah it's just that there's not this book is it doesn't add very much to the story overall in the series, and it doesn't have a good setup and payoff within the book just as a, as a standalone, right? And so that's what makes this book particularly disappointing. Um, and The Order of the Phoenix is, is a really just great example of that. Um, and what's what it's supposed to be in the book and what I think the original intent was. So like, basically, I think J.K. Rowling doesn't understand what what fascism versus anti-fascism even is, um, because otherwise the Order of the Phoenix would have been totally different. But I think what it's supposed to be and probably how it actually came about is we have the adults doing the Order of the Phoenix and the kids doing Double Doors Army. And there's supposed to be parallels between the two. But inside the text, you don't really see that because once Harry gets to Hogwarts, you don't really get a lot of insight into what the Order of the Phoenix is really getting up to and what they're doing. And so the possible parallel exists in a very superficial way that also that again makes the Order of the Phoenix just feel so limp. And it continues throughout the rest of the books too that the, the Order of the Phoenix never gets stronger than no. at this point. I mean, there's arguably in the seventh one when they rescue Harry, there's a strong point with them as well. But like, there's also this idea of Dumbledore is telling shit to Harry who is not in the Order of the Phoenix that nobody else in the Order of the Phoenix knows. So even then there's secrets on secrets on secrets on secrets. No one has any idea. And without Dumbledore as the pin holder in all of this, all of it is meaningless mm -hmm. and it falls apart. Yep. <sighs> but yeah, that's the no order. Payoff. <laughs> yep. No payoff. No payoff. Uh, just to be wary of time, we should probably continue. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about Dumbledore's abuse. There's a particular um, thing that happens in this book that's happened in previous books before, where Harry and Dumbledore at the end of the book get to sit down and really talk and really like delve things out. And in this book, they have a very 
long conversation where Dumbledore basically admits what he has been doing this whole book with hiding from Harry. And he throws in this little nugget, this like plot explanation, this this um, magic, the way magic functions explanation that really bothers me. Um, and basically what Dumbledore tells Harry is that the reason he has to go back to the Dursleys is because what seals the magical spell that Lily cast on Harry is with blood. So Lily ha ha Lily's cast a spell on Harry that saved him from Dumbledore and to seal that magic in, what Harry has to do is then keep ties with her blood. So he has to go live with his aunt, right? And that's how he ends up at the Dursleys. And that's why he has to keep going back to the Dursleys. So again, it's like, it's like JK Rowling got annoyed with people saying like, why the hell does he keep going back to the Dursleys? This is so tiring. And she's like, well, because magic guys, except now what that means is that magic and blood are intrinsically linked in a way that means, um, you know, so uh, Voldemort's kind of got a point. He's kind of not wrong. Here's a great example. And it's not like the real world. Like in the real world where you think about the in-groups and out-groups that fascists create, they're always based on things that make no sense. Like they're based on on race and, and they try to pretend that there's some kind of genetic component for race, but there just isn't. It doesn't exist. But in this world, the genetic genetic component for race, quote unquote, exists. Dumbledore believes in it too. And it's just, it's just ridiculous. This is stupid. This undermines the entire um, thesis of the book. It, it's just, it's the worst. It's the worst. I have dumb. Not... It's, it's dumb. So dumb. Uh, no, she, she just, she, she had a whole point and in one conversation undid it all. <laughs> yep. Uh, and gave a stupid reason and they're yeah i mean you said it perfectly she just they're, undermines it she undermines she undermines the entire potential moral thread these books could have had i'm losing my mind i'm way more upset about all of this than i thought it was gonna be <laughs> <laughs> because magic yeah i mean she she didn't have to like give a technical magic explanation she she could have she could have just been like um, she she could have just not addressed this at all. Like she could have just not addressed it at all. Like all of a sudden now um, now that that everything has happened in this book, maybe Harry just doesn't have to go back to the Dursleys anymore. Like she could have just stopped having him go back to the Dursleys. She didn't have to say why he went back in the previous books. He still had to keep going to the Dursleys because the Dursleys put him in the perfect abuse cycle so that Dumbledore could take advantage of him. If she was able to see that, she could come up with an excuse for Dumbledore to say that. That's the safest place for you now, Harry. Everyone else in the wizarding world is going to be looking for you. They would never look at your aunt and uncle's houses. I have built protection magic into your aunt and uncle's house. Blah, 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 blah. Anything that has to do other than the fact that, hey, because you're blood related to this person, there's magic there. And that's what's most important of all. Yeah, your explanation would have made way more sense and would have still fit the characters if she felt the need to explain it. Which anyway, this is why we like Harry Potter fanfic a lot more than the than the books once you get to this book. <laughs> the fandom also knows what to do. <laughs> well, also the, the power of thousands and thousands of brains is of course always gonna be better than one. So we come up with better ideas, of course, because there's thousands of us. But yeah, I just, I hate this point. And so I just wanted to rant about it a little bit. Um, and yeah, and I do think Dumbledore explaining things to Harry in this way was abusive. And if this is true, if this is how the magic works, why the fuck didn't Dumbledore say that in book one or two? Because and like, he tries to pretend like, oh, you're too young. So I didn't want to tell you. Oh my God. Because he didn't have Harry in the perfect place. Harry in this moment has just, I mean, let's think about where he is at this moment. The entire year. Dumbledore has not spoken to Harry at all, framed for his own protection, that he was scared that talking to Harry would mean that Voldemort knew that he was talking to him, and that would cause Harry to be in pain and be put in the middle. So for Harry's own fucking protection, the abused boy who has suffered beyond abuse, more comprehensible, comprehensible like to the human brain 
has then been put in this position where the one of the two people he finds safe in this world is refusing to talk to him refusing and it doesn't matter what he does if he starts an army if he gets you know is seen is seen seeing um, a snake attacking someone and thinking that it's a dream but it's actually real life if he loses everything that he has it doesn't fucking matter what harry does dumbledore will not speak to him no matter what until harry has nobody else left Dumbledore has withheld that love. And in that moment, when Harry has nobody else, no adult in his corner that he can trust, Dumbledore gives it all to him. All the information Harry could possibly need in that moment. It's It's like love from a narcissist. It just gives him everything he needs. And all of a sudden, Harry feels like he has been given everything. He finally understands the answer to everything, which we later find out is not fucking true. Because, because Dumbledore is still withholding the fact that Harry ultimately has to die because he has a horcrux inside of him. He's given Harry everything he wants and Harry's loyalty is suddenly so flooding over that Dumbledore is the only person that Harry will trust that as an adult from here on out. Only person. Yep. And it's so sad. It's so sad because if, if Dumbledore is supposed to be a good guy, there are so many ways he could have passed the message to Harry that, like, we can't talk because of what's going on with your dreams. Like, Dumbledore doesn't even have to tell him himself. It could have just been, like, Molly taking Harry aside and being like, hey, um, this is going to be really hard for you, and Dumbledore feels really bad, but this is what's going to be happening, and please let me know if you need anything, because I know that Dumbledore's not going to be able to be there, and he really wants to be. Like, that could have been a conversation. So if Dumbledore was really a good guy and really cared about Harry, he would have set something like that up so that Harry wasn't completely in the dark but he doesn't really care about Harry what he really wants is to put Harry in the position that Harry needs to be in so that Voldemort can die because this in this world it is the good guys versus bad guys and the day will be saved if Voldemort's killed we don't have to address any of the systems that went into why Voldemort did what he did or became who he became we're just going to kill Voldemort and then everything's going to be perfect again and we have to manipulate this child because at the same time this boy is still 15 years old he is still a child We have to manipulate this child to the perfect position that at less than 18 years old, he'll be willing to kill himself for the betterment of this world. Awful. It's awful. It's such, and, but you know what? He's the good guy. He's the good guy. (laughs) At least he's consistent because he does this to Sirius too. You know, he does this to Sirius too. That's the whole thing, right? And, but he never could successfully do it to Sirius. And that's the whole thing about Sirius Black. He couldn't, he tricked, he tricked all of the children from the Marauders era to graduate and then join the Order of the Phoenix. He tricked all of them and had them all in, but Sirius Black, he was never able to trick. And this is more fanon than canon, but like the reason why Dumbledore never went out and was like, hey, BT Dubs, that guy, not the secret keeper. Let's keep him in jail for 12 years, even though he never stood trial or was convicted at all. (laughs) Let's just keep him in jail and I'll never speak up. Uh, Or once he's out of jail, I'll never speak up once I have power again that maybe this man is innocent. Or even to that extent, to, to be like, hey, you're out of jail, but I'm going to imprison you in the house that you hate because you are not doing what I say you need to be doing. Mm -hmm. and i'm going Mm -hmm. to let you die because you are a threat to this whole thing if harry loves you too much he will not do what he needs to do so you need to die yep yep and it's just awful it's just awful and i I wouldn't think And I wouldn't think it was so awful if there was a glimmer of realization that that's what the story that was really being told in the books, but there's simply not. There's simply not. And so it just makes it super tragic. Yeah. Dumbledore and Severus Snape are heroes that Harry is going to name his son after. Let's just like, as I get older, (laughs) that hurts me so much more to be like, this JKR was so unaware of the characters that she was writing that she had her character name her their his son after the two people that abused him most in the stories and called them the bravest people that he's ever met. 
that's fine. <laughs> it's I fine. can't. I can't. I just, I can't. Well, right. Ron is right there. Ron is right there. Right Hello. there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> It just breaks my heart. It breaks my heart um, because I just feel like I just feel like there's there's so much going on here that J.K. Rowling accidentally put in that's really based on her worldview and her experiences um, with just so little self awareness. And it's just it's very hard for me to uh, to go back and uh, and look at this and feel anything but complete and abject pity for Sirius Black. Sirius Black had every right to want to leave that house sometimes. Every right. And Dumbledore should have been doing what he could to take that dog on walks. Okay. I mean, I'm making a little bit of a light on it, but that's what he should have been doing. That's what he should, if he cared about Sirius, that's what he should have been doing. And he didn't. And it's fine. Like it all tells a fantastic story, but I think at the end of the day, we are being sold that this is the pinnacle of good and it's not. Nope. Like that's, not. that's the problem. If someone had come out, JK Rowling had come out and been like, actually what I meant to do was show that both sides of the war are evil. That we would have been talking about how incredibly amazing Dumbledore is written because Very he's, nuanced. It, he's an incredibly amazing character, but because we're being told no, this is the pinnacle of goodness. Is it? <laughs> Is I can't really? roll my eyes hard enough. I can't roll my <laughs> eyes hard enough. Exactly. Um, Alpha Tip. Um, L O L L O L. I can't wait to us to deep dive this character because genuinely, Dumbledore is one of my favorite characters in the series. Yeah. Uh, if you take how he is written as he is written, he is one of the best written characters in the series. And I'm so excited to actually dive into him and do a deep dive when we get to there. Mm -hmm. But right now, man. The abuse he has. We're going to talk more about Dumbledore later. We're going to, this is, this is, you have not heard the last of our Dumbledore takes, even though we've heard, we've had several, but there will be more. (laughs) book to be published in the books about Dumbledore. There's deep dives to be given. I'm trying to convince Karen to let me do an entire episode about Dumbledore. We'll see. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. We're not, we're not committed yet, but yeah. Okay. Spot the problems time. So as you guys know, um, during the last like 20, 30 minutes of the, the streams for Harry Potter, one of the segments we love to do is called Spot the Problems. So our Spot the Problems this time is um, is echoes of our Spot the Problems from a couple of episodes ago. Instead, instead of um, Fleur de la Croix deserved better, it's Cho Chang deserved better. Cho Chang deserved better. And it starts with that awful name. name. It's I can't believe that she named her one Asian character Cho Chang. You wow. Mean you can't believe that the racist rich white lady I know she wasn't rich, what, rich at the time, but the racist white lady named the Asian character Cho Chang because she probably hasn't ever met an Asian person in her life. My god. Okay, so listeners, did you know that the poor actress playing Cho Chang got a constant uh just flood of racial hatred towards her while she was playing this character? Um, well, that happened and it affects this girl to this day. And, uh, and she'll, she talks about it in a few interviews. That was a thing that people did to this, this child who was working on the movie to play this character. That's great. But it's not just about the actress or the character's name. Literally how Cho Chang is written is also a problem. It is not just an unfortunate naming issue or the racism of, of you know, fans or other people. It's, it's in the book too. It's in the book too. So Cho Chang's story, just to give you guys a little bit of primer for you, if you don't remember, she uh, joins the, the DA in these books. And this is also when she sort of kind of dates Harry. So well, in the, it's sorry, important to also preface that she had dated Cedric Diggory. Yes. Yes. Okay. So in the previous book, if you remember, she had a crush on both Harry and Cedric. Cedric asked her first, so she went with Cedric, and then he died. So now she's like got very complicated, complex feelings about her crush on Harry, who was there when her previous boyfriend died, and um, she has every right to have high expectations of Harry on the date that they go on where she puts on him, like, I thought you were the one person that I could talk to about Cedric. I thought you would understand. She's right. And why the heck doesn't Harry understand? Why? It doesn't make any sense. Actually, this is one of the times where I really do think that Harry was kind of out of character. 
It doesn't I mean, make sense. I under I understand it if the if the perspective was this is too much and I can't talk about it because that is a huge part of what he's yeah, going through. But that's not what happens. That's not what goes through his head. No. And like it's it's not even like I get also not being able to communicate that. I think that's really realistic. But like that's not even what goes in his thoughts of being like, I have to get out of here. I can't talk about it. It's just like, why would you want to talk about it? <laughs> yeah, it's so dumb. Now, if his thoughts were written differently, if they were written more like what you're saying, where he was so overwhelmed, like, I don't think you would have had to change anything about his actions or the things that he said to Cho. You could have just changed the inner dialogue and it would have fixed things. Like, he thought he was going on, like, a regular date. It didn't occur to Harry that, like, you know, dating Cho, whose boyfriend died would, would like have some kind of ramification it's 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 almost like in his mind cho pops into existence when she's around harry and pops out of existence when she's not around harry like that's I, how he seems to think of her that's how he thinks of every person yeah except except the adults in his life that's how he thinks of every other peer except dumbledore except dumbledore and serious i mean i think yeah. he, there are a few adults that he knows has lives but every other peer yeah, he acts he acts like Cho he, he acts like Cho is out of line for wanting to talk about this stuff. And there's really no time in the book where someone sits Harry down and is like, bruh, of course she wants to talk about it with you. You're the only person who could talk about it with her. What's wrong with you? Why don't you want to talk about it? But that never happens. Instead, what the books do is they make this conflict about this weird jealousy battle that Cho Chang invents between herself and Hermione. It is so fucking dumb. It would only make sense if Cho really didn't have any history in the books. Like if the whole Cedric thing wasn't a thing, then the jealousy would make sense. But adding it on when they already have a rich possibility of plot with what happened between Cho and Cedric is like, it's just, it's wasteful, it's awful, and it does smell misogynistic like a lot of other things in this book. Yep. Well, and it's like this idea of, of again, boiling female characters down to away from like complexity and to like base things of being like, I'm so jealous that you are prioritizing your friends, which real thing, right? Girls get like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. But that's like not the issue that should be happening between these two. <laughs> that's, that's not, not why Cho should be mad at Harry. Uh, and and also nothing until that moment, until her being, until she's like, why are you leaving for to go see Hermione? Like gave any indication that this was an issue. Mm -hmm. If there had been even a moment of like, them talking at some point and her like being jealous of Hermione still would have hated it but at least it would have not seemed like to pop out of nowhere when this is the reason that they have a huge fight and break up and never speak again <laughs> it just doesn't it doesn't make sense to make this the plot when there's a way more interesting plot that starts at the beginning of the date and it's almost like after they introduce this jealousy um element Cho anger or frustration about having no one to talk to about Cedric's death just evaporates. She doesn't ever try to do this again with Harry. Harry never brings it up with her. No one ever um, asks Harry about it. It's just, it just disappears. They never interact afterwards. Yeah. Like, that's the other thing, too. Talk about dropping a ball on a plot. Like, that we, we for two books, we get the better heart part of Harry's crush on Cho Chang pining over the fact that she she said yes to Cedric feeling a little jealous about it and then Cedric dying and then the complex emotions and then like realizing that he still has a crush on Cho and there being chemistry there and they kiss and it's complicated and weird and everyone and everyone's a little weirded by it or at least Harry's a little weirded out by it I, if uh, I was there I'd be a little bit weirded out by it I'd be like really I mean I'm not gonna lie <laughs> all right. then they go on this date they have a bad date and then they don't ever speak again. Which makes like, no sense because remember the other part of Cho's plot in this book is that she joins the DA. So why the heck, is why? There in the DA still learning lessons. And then soon after her best friend betrays the DA. Man, Cho can't catch a break. Like, at no point in time 
does like Hermione drag Harry along to go talk to Cho and be like, what the fuck happened? Like, yeah, why, where, why doesn't she do Harry? that? Why doesn't Harry jump? Why doesn't Hermione go to Cho and be like, it's not what you think, girlfriend? Why? Well, like, and Hermione, I don't think ever. I don't think Harry ever tells Hermione about it. No, he does. He does. When he first yeah, goes yeah, yeah. at yes. the very right after the date, he tells her and Hermione has this reaction of like, she's crazy. That's not real. And then and then literally Hermione has no other thoughts or, or, or things about it. It's because they just dropped this thing. And it was like, OK, I get I get that. Like. This is young adult romance is expected within the genre you have to start dropping that she had already dropped something uh and she wanted to kind of pick it up but like then she completely fucking dropped the ball again yeah and it and it and it came out of like nowhere it would have been better if like it had just kind of lingered or had died out or or whatever or also harry realizing at some point Maybe I shouldn't date right now since there's a war going on. <laughs> right? It could have been that, or it could have even been, it could have even been awkward. Like maybe they don't verbally address it because Harry's yeah. really bad at that. But maybe there's like a second kiss. Or maybe there's like um there's like this um this Cho asks him out again and he declines her, or just something, but there's nothing. And this poor character, this poor character just gets stomped on her entire plot in addition to this awful romance um she like you said she has the betrayal of marietta so it's just like everything we know about cho is just misfortune upon misfortune upon misfortune boy, poor girl she has a terribly racist name her boyfriend dies she her gets, best friend's the betrayer her best friend is the betrayer she doesn't get any comfort or closure or any sort of somebody who could understand what she's going through with harry she gets nothing and then we never except for like a cameo here or there throughout the entire series we never hear from her again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think she joins in the seventh where she comes back to defend hogwarts because she's a year older but like we never hear from her in the sixth book we don't hear anything yep and it's just it's just such a shame it's just such a shame because it's once again a female character is introduced they are given very little to do, and the few things that they're given to do are just like very stereotypical, boring, trite things in the plot. And and this one in particular, this one I think I feel even I feel more passionate about than Floor because there's so much potential there that just gets wasted. Yeah. Well, it's again, it's it's a pattern. Yeah. This is a pattern. Of, of disrespect towards young female characters. Yep. Um, and we talked about how we see it in Hermione. We're also seeing it in all the side characters. And that really should be, and all the adults. Misogyny abound. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Although Hermione is kind of a, a boss in this book because she does oh, yeah. start the DADA. And then it's kind of seen as Harry's thing, but like Hermione literally did all the work for it and all the hard, annoying parts. Harry just got Hermione, to come in and facilitate. <laughs> welcome to her character. That's what she's been doing since the beginning and will continue to do for the rest of the books. True. But, but she's she kind of bombing this one. But how she is treated. Yeah. Like the fact that she isn't considered prettier until like, this is a thing that we didn't even mention last book until like she's physically attacked attacked with a like tooth growing spell and Snape like is like whatever and then she goes and gets it fixed but then she makes her teeth smaller because that's what's always made her ugly was that she had big teeth and as soon as her teeth are smaller everyone suddenly thinks she's prettier it's like, almost <laughs> as if like you know in the movies when they straighten the the curly girl's hair and yeah. then oh she's prettier now and it's like what what, what? <laughs> um but so like Hermione still gets that same treatment, even though she's a more round character, mm -hmm. but she still has the same treatment and misogyny mm -hmm. as, as any of the other side women characters. Yeah, the things the things I'm remembering, Lily, as I'm going back and reading these books, um, you know, uh, in 2022, <laughs> there's things I had forgotten about, too, where I'm reading it and I'm like, that's is that really what happened? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> disgusting thing well and like snape just being like that whole scene makes me so angry snape just being like she has giant beaver teeth i see no difference mm -hmm. how is this man still in a job <laughs> he shouldn't, shouldn't be you shouldn't be yep <clears throat> so Sorry cho chang deserved so much cho chang deserved better
It's fine. It's fine. I've got your I've got your volume turned down. So even if you shout, it doesn't oh. go. It doesn't go all the way. So oh, you know me so well. <laughs> so yeah, that um, that's our spot. The problems for this book. It's Cho Chang deserved better. Oh yeah, she did. Yep. All right. All right. We did really fucking well. So we're gonna go into our final thoughts. Uh, yep. 10 minutes before the end of the stream we did so good it's almost like we needed two episodes <laughs> yes almost we planned it pretty good okay guys so we're we're of course um at the end of the next episode gonna do like our our regular kind of like does does it resonate that we like to give for final thoughts so for final thoughts for this episode since this is a two-parter i would like to just tease a little bit about what we're going to be talking about next episode so we oh. called this one um harry potter and the order of uh, abuse and next episode we're going to be calling Harry Potter and the Order of Truth because as you probably noticed in this particular episode we only very lightly touched on Harry's passivity in this story which is the main or, thing that gets criticized in this book Harry at all yeah Harry at all we didn't talk about Harry because Harry's not in this book <laughs> we only talked about things in relation to him so next episode we're going to dive actually deeper into like why is harry so passive in this book why do we only ever see him doing certain things why does the plot just carry him along um so we're going to dive a lot deeper into that and we're also going to talk a little bit about the concept of the privacy of the mind within the Harry Potter universe, because it is actually pretty complex when you think about it. We've got a lot of things in this universe that affect the mind. We've got people getting possessed. We've got, and I can't say these words, so Landon, you can say the, them the right way, aquamancy and le legilimency. I think and legilimency. Legilimency. Thank you so much. And Verita serum. Um, we've got prophecies that happen in these books. So we're going to talk about um, the concept of, of truth and how truth is portrayed in the Harry Potter books and what that means about Harry's passivity, particularly in this book. Yeah. What the fuck was Harry doing all book? I'd like to know. Um, um, not. He was. Not he much. kissed Cho. He kissed judging, Cho once. That judging, he did that. Judging people a mm -hmm. lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Being a victim of abuse. <laughs> yeah. Getting victimized and being judgy. Yeah. Letting Hermione do everything for him and then just setting up and just coming in at the end and doing, yeah. Mm -hmm. And getting all the credit for everything. Truly, yeah. Truly hairy stuff. Yes. All right. Well, then I think that we should go into our ending. Okay. All right, so where can you find us? You can find me. This is like Harry Potter therapy, so we can all heal. Ah, oh, thank you so much, Kitty. This feels like Harry Potter therapy for me too. As you guys know, we started this series particularly because I was feeling so much anger at JK Rowling over the things that she was saying and the things she was advocating for in regards to trans people. Um, and that coupled with the fact that Harry Potter was such a big part of my my youth and my fandom experience i just had to reconcile that somehow so yes this is you are literally listening to my harry potter therapy sessions landon's walking me through it <laughs> man, oh man and i just could talk about harry potter anytime any place so hit mm -hmm. me up. <laughs> yep so where can you find me i upload all of my vods to youtube so you can find me there uh as far as social media i am most active on twitter we have a discord server as well and of course i have a card that lists anything and everything that you could possibly want to know about me also fun thing i spent my lunch break on friday redoing my twitch about so if you scroll down to my about section below the stream uh, you'll see everything looks different it's all the same information i just tried, made it prettier at least what i thought was prettier it needed a refresh um, as we said just a moment ago, our next episode of Interstage Window is going to be, again, about Order of the Phoenix. We're going to do a part two, so Harry Potter and the Order of Truth. Uh, in addition to these Interstage Window streams, I also stream on Thursday, and that show is just kind of the By Myself show. And right now, we are doing a Nuzlocke of Leaf Green, the Pokemon game that I have played the most. So feel free to join us for there. Nobody send Landon the clip from the last stream. <laughs> Nobody tell Wait, Landon what? what happened. Nobody what happened? tell Landon what happened. Landon, where can they find you? Well, I want to know what happened. Uh, you can <laughs> find me at Land in Maine on both Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I'm on a wordle streak and sometimes I post about it. 
Uh, you can also find me on Karen's Discord or the Cafe Discord. Someone earlier in the comments asked for FICREX. I will totally drop a link or some recs if that is actually something that people would be interested in. Yeah, give uh, us your favorite dreary and, and lily fix. I know that's your top ones and those are really popular. I think people would like them. Yeah. Uh, you can also find me here almost every Saturday, uh, especially next week. And I think that's yep. it. Okay. All right, guys. <laughs> Let's find somebody to raid. Let's see. Raid, who do we want to raid into? What today? happened What happened on Pokemon? <laughs> You're just going to have to figure it out yourself. God damn it. Somebody tell me what happened in Pokemon. <laughs> Thank you. I can live. Thank you so much for the applause, Kitty. Now Landon can live another week. It's nothing. Thank you, Kitty. <laughs> right. Thank Kitty you. won't snitch. Who will snitch? <laughs> <laughs> I will pay you in love and affection. <laughs> Because I oh don't think any other anything else I can, <laughs> I can offer. Oh my god! Will, All right, guys. I will write you a fan fiction of your choice. Tell me what Ooh. happened. Wow. Okay. Can we pick pairing? Can we pick our pick the pairing and the setting yes, and everything? But, uh, I'm gonna have to say that it has to be Harry Potter relevant because there's okay. no other sources. But you can absolutely pick the pairing. Okay. Um, Landon will write you your own um, Harry Potter fanfic. So you let her know the pairing and, um, you know, what kind of thing that you're looking for. But you have to tell me what happened on Pokemon <laughs> last week. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to raid into the soda drink cat because he has not streamed in a really long time. And as you guys know, um, he adopted one of the kitty cats whenever I was fostering all of those kittens. So we're going to raid into soda. Um, he's playing Elden Ring right now, just like everybody else is. So we can go watch him, what I assume will be dying a lot. I watch my husband play it, and that's what he does in that game. So that's what I think we're going to see. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. Of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. All right. Bye, everybody. See you later. Bye.